Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Bruce Florsheim again. Welcome to our second of the logistics forums uh, for this afternoon. Uh, for this one, we're focused on lower extremities. Uh, we have four people who are participating uh, on our panel in this forum, two of whom are going to be the primary speakers, Matt Marino and Matt Yandel from HeroWare. But we also have Terry Butler from Lean Steps Consulting and Jason Gillette from Iowa State University. If you saw them earlier, you were probably watching the lower uh, the logistics forum for upper extremities where they were presenting and they're back to participate in this forum, especially if there are additional Q a uh, that are desired. The format for this will be that both of the mats will speak to, uh, in tandem, and that will take about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we will open it up for Q&A. Of course, you can start posting your questions as soon as they come. Remember to use the Q&A function. Any technical difficulties, use the chat function. Uh, the plan is to have about uh, 15 minutes toward the tail end, and you can uh, for panelists. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Matt Marino. Thanks, Bruce. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for session two of our logistics forum. Um, I just want to start out and briefly thank uh, everybody at the Wearable Robotics Association, Bruce, Joe, Tom, Arun, Amy, and, and the rest of your team. You guys have done a great job. Um, I would also like to thank everybody who's given presentations so far. It's been such a great collection of, of presenters and speakers and the presentations have been fantastic. So I really appreciate what everybody has shared with the community. Um, so like Bruce said, my name is Matt Marino and I'm joined today by my friend and my HeroWare colleague, Matt Yandel. And we're gonna talk about overcoming challenges with implementing back assist exosuits specifically in the logistics industry. Um, the purpose or objectives, we have a few objectives today that, that we want to talk about. First, we're going to set the stage and kind of talk about why back assist exoskeletons even really exist and discuss some of the challenges that they and really all exoskeletons face, especially when it comes to widespread acceptance and adoption. We also share our experience and some data and results from field testing exosuits in the logistics setting. And then we wanna talk about some big lessons that we learned over the past five or six years of, um, of taking these devices, designing them, and bringing them out into the field. So logistics work is very physical. Uh, it can be very heavy, it can be very repetitive. The facilities are not always air conditioned. The environment can be very harsh. Um, it's amazing how much weight people have to lift and haul just to make sure that you know, we all get our packages in, in two days or less. And, and the work that people do can really take a serious toll on the body. So I wanna start with a quick story. So last summer and fall, I was working with a man who had injured his back. And, and for privacy, I'm just gonna call him John throughout the presentation. And by the time I was brought in, he was on modified duty. He was trying to transition back to full duty as a warehouse stalker. And, and this is actually him here. And, and I wanna stop here and thank uh, Kelson Wan and the folks at Briotics Health for sharing these images with us. Um, this gentleman, John, was happy to be back at work and he didn't wanna get re-injured because he had a family to support and this included an adult child with cerebral palsy with a disability. So working in a warehouse from 4 a.m. to noon, then going home and helping his son had really taken a toll on his body, especially his low back. And, there was a multidisciplinary team involved in the return to work process, and they all agreed, and John agreed, to give an exoskeleton a try. So I brought the device out, and I trained him, um, got it fully adjusted for him, observed him in the workplace with the device, made sure that he could use it independently, and we scheduled weekly visits to, to make sure that we were following up on a regular basis. And at those visits, we would collect functional outcome me measures like the Oswestry, and he would give great subjective feedback about the exoskeleton. So he continued to use it until he got back to full duty, but then he decided to stop. And, and this was a little bit unusual. It came as a surprise. Why was he giving us the device back? And he admitted that it was reducing the strain in his low back when he was bending and lifting, but he was experiencing discomfort in other parts of his body that he felt were related to the exoskeleton. And it was preventing him from doing his job and moving the way that he was used to doing it. 
he couldn't get as close to some of the objects that he needed to reach, which he's trying to show us in the right hand image there. He couldn't um, move between pallets and, and get into tight spaces because the XO was restricting his movement and it was snagging on some of the shrink wrap. He was also getting tired of having to readjust the straps as the device shifted and um, as they loosened up throughout the day. So for him, the downsides of the device outweighed some of the benefits of the device and, and this was a problem for him. So with that, um, I think that exoskeletons have so much potential to combat back pain and a great opportunity to help solve this enormous problem. But when we have stories like John's that highlight a lot of these challenges, we see how much work we have to do to make this a reality. Back pain is truly a Goliath. It is, it is a major problem. Uh, I have uh, confidence saying that 80% of you have probably experienced it in your lifetime. You know exactly what I'm talking about. 80% of the world's population will. And um, it's the number three reason, I believe, for doctor visits. And it's the single leading cause of disability worldwide. It prevents people from aging at work and from doing the things that they love to do outside of work. It costs us about 264 million lost work days per year. And you know, monetarily, it costs over $100 billion a year in the US between the direct healthcare costs and the indirect costs associated with treating it. The BLS data in the US is very clear about this too. In this chart, you see the black bars indicate that back injuries dominate all other body parts for all occupations, especially for the jobs listed here, which include logistics workers and stock clerks like John. So as an ergonomist, we always try to apply the hierarchy of controls to reduce the risk for injury because it's always more effective to eliminate the risk altogether. But the problem is that many jobs out there are very difficult to automate or re-engineer. And even if it is possible to do that, it could be years away before that actually happens. So what are workers like John supposed to do until that happens? Where do exoskeletons even fall in this hierarchy? they don't fit very well. So it's difficult for some to really know when they're appropriate to use. Luckily, we have alternative hierarchies like the one proposed here by Rick Goggins that do a little bit of a better job uh, identifying what the impact is going to be at the worker level. And that's why I really like this hierarchy. And, and we see here that exos can reduce the level of risk if they can reduce strain and fatigue. And they may be able to reduce the time of exposure if they have a positive impact on performance. So they really should be included in a company's comprehensive ergonomics program, like we've heard from a couple of companies here at the conference. Where we can eliminate exposure, that's great, but where we can't, there are definitely some good applications for these devices. So as we can see here, back, uh, ergonomics really does work and injuries have been on a decline for the last couple of decades, but back pain is still the biggest problem when it comes to workplace injuries. And the rate of decline for shoulder injuries, as you can see here, lags other body parts. So these are two body areas that are in need of solutions and there are exos designed specifically for them. So the question is why are we not seeing broader adoption of exo technology? And this is, this is why. Um, many exos on the market today do a really good job of assisting workers, but they have a tendency of creating new problems, like the ones that John was reporting and more. So we need to be really careful that we're not implementing solutions that create new problems. These create trade-offs that are often unacceptable for workers and companies and really for good reason. So what I did here with this slide was I took many of the issues reported by participants at the 2018 ErgoX Symposium, and I added a lot of the most common concerns that I've been hearing from workers and companies over the past couple of years since then. And I saw, I think Chris and Caden had the 2019 word cloud. So I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing that and seeing how things have changed from those participants. But it's clear here that there's a lot of work that we still need to do to overcome these challenges and deliver technology to workers that they want to use every day. These are the types of technologies that in my mind, workers can almost forget that they're even wearing, but that they're grateful for at the end of their shift. So one of the big reasons that I joined HeroWare is because as a team, 
we strongly believe in the importance of understanding user needs in terms of assistance, comfort, and what I like to call wearability. And now Matt Yandel is going to talk about his experience over the past six years doing rigorous science in the lab, listening to voices from workers, and using what he's learned to design an EXO that can really start to break down some of these barriers. All right, you should be able to see my presentation at this point. Yep, you're good, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, Bruce. Uh, in the last several years developing exosuits, we have uh, settled on sort of three primary um, outcomes for designing effective exo devices, um, all of which we've heard in some form or another during the conference. Uh, the first thing is assist the user. As a whole, the exo community has been doing a really fantastic job of designing devices that can assist users and provide biomechanical benefit. However, the second much greater challenge is really not interfering with users range of motion, as I think we've heard several times as well. Uh, for instance, on the job, logistics workers tend to do lifting and leaning about 10% of the time and other tasks about 90%. So if we're constraining people's movements, it really cuts down on their ability to do their job. Uh, third, we need to design devices that are comfortable and practical, both day to day and over the course of a year. A uh, user adoption is a make or break uh, scenario for exoskeletons, something we really need to uh, focus on. So in summary, exos need to assist sometimes to get out of the way the rest of the time and be comfortable and practical all the time. So let's dive into how we've been investigating based on these principles in the lab and then how we've been then applying them in the field to test exosuits out in the real world. In our first study in back assistive technology at Vanderbilt University, we looked at assisting the user. Uh, we showed that our passive elastic design could reduce back muscle activity by 14 to 16% in lifting and more than twice that in leaning. And then in a follow-up study, we showed that we could reduce low back fatigue risk uh, by 20 to 80%. Uh, I would encourage you to read those studies uh, for more information. Um, now, these kinds of studies that show we can assist users with both powered or passive devices are throughout literature, um, which Carl Zellick nicely summarized in his talk yesterday. But the field is currently facing a gap in knowledge of how to quantify and understand um, other parts of the design, such as minimizing interference and making exos comfortable to wear. We wanted to start tackling that problem and conducted a quantitative study to determine how users perceive and experience comfort, which we published two months ago in PLOS One. Uh, we used a robotic actuator to apply forces repeatedly to multiple body segments until the subjects reported reaching their discomfort limit. Uh, for the shoulders, thigh, and shank, participants report a comfort limit of about one body weight, and comfort limit tended to increase over multiple testing days or with increasing rates of force application. Uh, of note, here wears exosuit applies forces well below this comfort limit. But what I want to emphasize here is the need to continue broadening our lines of research beyond the focus of assisting the user. Um, this is to help establish guidelines on how to create devices that uh, don't interfere and are comfortable and practical with the overall goal of driving the widespread adoption of exotechnologies that we haven't seen up to this point and really the reason that we're all here. Uh, to understand the needs of end users and move towards that widespread adoption, uh, we started taking our devices out into the field to see what users' opinions really were. Uh, the field is really the only place you can get reliable information on how assistive, practical, and comfortable your device really is and whether or not it interferes with workers' movements. As a community, we are used to quantifying user assistance in the lab, but quantifying these things in the field has a much more challenging logistics and study design as we saw in the previous logistics forum. Um, getting at more subjective measures like comfort, practicality, and usability information also requires thoughtful planning. Um, so now I wanna share our experience getting lab quality objective and subjective data, but out in the field. So ideally, <laughs> you'd be able, for field testing, be able to take an exosuit, a researcher, and add a warehouse. Uh, in reality, field testing is actually filling cardboard boxes with 50 pounds of dried beans from three gallon buckets, then taking a 75 item packing list and finding a way to Tetris it together in a package small enough that you can fit it on a two foot by four foot cart that unpacks into an SUV and fits through an airhouse 
lobby, a warehouse, excuse me, lobby door, um, and then checking your packing list two dozen times and making just as many Amazon orders because you have to do a dozen test runs in a conference room to make sure you have everything you need. Uh, the point here is to make no mistake, field testing requires a lot of planning and preparation in order to execute well and is very different from in lab testing. Now, once we actually arrived at the facility, we first set up our test equipment and checked for signal interference. Uh, when the participant came off the warehouse floor, the key focus of our first interaction with them was communicating who we were, what the point of the test and the device was, and why it mattered to them. So often participants came to us and they had just heard about the experiment that day and weren't even sure who we were. So communicating that was really crucial. The most important part of the orientation was then getting participant buy-in. Um, this consisted of fitting the suit on the participant, having them test drive it and getting their first impression, and then having them help us select the stiffness of assistive bands that they wanted to use. It's hard to overemphasize how important this part of the process was as we included them in fitting the exosuit and picking the right assistive bands to fit their body type, um, their excitement to participate in the experiments only grew. Um, after orientation and fitting, we prepared the participant, then had them complete a task that was designed to be a realistic task, similar to their real job, but repeatable enough for quality EMG data. Uh, after the simulated job task, they completed a survey. They then did their actual job while wearing the suit, followed by a final survey to get their impression of the whole experience. Uh, we instrumented the participant with six EMG muscle activity sensors on the low back, uh, which adds a measure of redundancy in case of signal loss. We then tested for signal quality and had the participant do a maximum voluntary contraction using a portable Roman chair. We then moved on to the simulated job task where we have participants repeatedly lift a 10 kilogram box from a pallet to a table and then in reverse from a table back to the pallet. Um, it's important to note that we did not tell them how they should complete the lift, only the start and end points so that they could do it as naturally as possible. Now, from the feedback that we got, workers said the task was very similar to their everyday job, which increased our confidence that this was a fairly realistic yet repeatable task that included lifting, lowering, and twisting. Um, they completed this task repeatedly in their normal clothing, and while wearing the exosuit, which gave us the necessary EMG data for within subject comparisons. We then took the EMG data and scaled it according to maximum voluntary contraction uh, for lifting and lowering cycles, and then split it into cycles of lifting and lowering both with and without wearing the suit. Uh, right now, let's focus on the lifting part. So on the left plot, you can see EMG lifting data for one participant for one sensor without wearing the suit. The gray columns, there's four of them, showing the x-axis time progression, indicate the whole process of the subject lifting the box from the pallet and then setting it up on the table, which we just saw, where the y-axis is the EMG magnitude in percent maximum voluntary contraction. The individual trials are gray lines, and then the average value is the bolded green line. Then we did the same process for trials while the participant was wearing the exosuit which you can see on the right. We then took these two average curves for again, one participant, one EMG, and compare them to look for changes in EMG activity, uh, comparing wearing the suit versus not wearing the suit. And then we averaged that result across all the EMG sensors and then repeated the process for lowering. After you do all this, you get a bar chart for that participant that shows muscle activity as a percentage of maximum voluntary contraction for lifting in the cyan color and then lowering in the blue color. Um, note that for this participant, lifting and lowering had very similar responses, which we saw across all the participants in our study. Now, uh, if you do this for all 11 of our participants, you get similar plots for each of them. On average, back muscle activity decreased by 9% across all participants and 15% across the seven who showed reductions. The high level takeaway here is that field testing is difficult. The data is not as clean as in the lab and requires significant care to get correct results. But despite that, we found that just like in the lab, the majority of participants had a reduction in back muscle activity, which means that most of the users had a measurable benefit to using the suit, doing movements in an unconstrained real world task, just like their jobs. Now, after the participant completed the simulated task and survey, 
they went out to do their real job in the suit. You can see a couple of examples here with a case picker on the left and someone palletizing on the right. Uh, and after they completed part of their shift on the warehouse floor wearing the suit, we had them come back and do a final survey. Those final survey results are depicted here with one bar ranging from minus 100% to positive 100% of participants for each question. Uh, red are negative responses, gray are neutral, and green are positive. Um, the key takeaway here is that the vast majority of question responses were positive. There's very little red. Um, here I want to emphasize that subjective responses are just as important as, if not more important, than objective data. Um, user acceptance is critical for exoskeletons and anything less than a stellar user review is going to hamper widespread adoption. Um, next, I want to highlight some specific questions in the survey results um, that, that tie back to the three rules of exo design I talked about at the beginning. So assisting the user. So users heavily indicated that exos the exosuit made lifting easier and that they felt that they were assisted by it in lifting. Um, there were no negative responses to these questions either before or after users got to use the suit in their real job. Uh, and over 90% had a positive reaction. When we look at whether the exosuit interfered with movement, far and away the users said that the suit would fit into their job and not interfere and that they can move freely while using it. And last, in regards to comfort and practicality, we again had overwhelmingly positive responses to how easy it was to use and the overall comfort. Uh, I'd like to finish with some quotes from the users who participated in the study. Um, I get tired quicker without the super suit. The suit slingshots you back up. Once you start, it pushes you the rest of the way. Out on the floor, it didn't hinder my movement a lot and I could feel it taking strain off my back when I was lifting the cat litter. It didn't hinder the movements at all. I could still do everything I needed to do. Box that I pick up all the time felt lighter and easier to pick up. And I can already tell a big difference. It feels, feel it's really helping. My back hurts 75% of the time, but I can already feel a difference. In summary, field testing is not for the faint of heart, but is crucial to proving out how effective exoskeleton devices can be in the real world. Um, second, our exosuit objectively and subjectively assisted users in real world tasks and that those users could see it fitting into their jobs and wanted to use it more. Uh, importantly, since doing these tests, we've made substantial improvements to the device, including uh, breathability, usability, and overall practicality that you've seen images of over the course of the conference. Um, that position it as a device that tr users truly want to use day in and day out. Um, now I'll hand the bike, mic back to Matt Marino to talk more about the vital importance of understanding the practical needs of users. Thanks, Matt. Bear with me while I get my screen back up here. Bruce, are you, can you confirm that I'm sharing my screen? Yes. yes. Thank you. Well, excellent job, Matt. Thanks for presenting all of that uh, great information and data. So between our field testing and our experience over the years, there have been a lot of lessons learned from the workers who've been testing and using devices. And I think they can really help us understand the pros and cons of the technology. And I've always liked to say that um, we, we tend to learn our best lessons from our biggest failures. So there's so much more to learn from their, ne their negative feedback really than there is from their positive feedback. So I'm just gonna go through and quickly share some of my biggest lessons. One of the biggest ones I've learned, which I even wrote an article about recently, is that we need women to feel just as comfortable as men while wearing exoskeletons. And I can't tell you all how many times I've had a female worker ask me, don't they make a version of this exoskeleton for women or simply, how am I supposed to wear this? Women are greater than 50% of our workforce at this point, including the logistics industry, and they're not gonna wear devices that are not comfortable for them. Another major challenge has been fitting every vibe with the same exoskeleton. So male and female fit is a great start, but then we need to look at all the different variations each and ensure that we can fit them all with equal comfort. And this is really a huge range. 
But when we think about it, anthropometrics provide the foundation for static fit. We also need to consider that the physical and mental capabilities of people vary significantly and exos need to be useful for and usable by all people. So if only very fit people who learn how to use technology very quickly can use a device, it's really not going to fit a huge percentage of the potential user population. Um, to learn how to use a device quickly, we can really think about something like an iPhone. Um, these devices can be used by you know, young and old, weak and strong, smart and not so smart, good movers and, and people that are motorically challenged. But these individual capabilities that we have to design for will really dictate dynamic and cognitive fit of the devices. So many exoskeletons have also been found to be very task specific. And the reality is that work is highly varied. So we need exos to help when we need them, but allow us to do everything else without restriction when we don't. And in these images, we can see just some of the examples of task variety in the logistics industry specifically, picking from steel, pushing a cart, transporting and setting up pallets, driving forklifts, labeling cases, lifting of course, and wrapping pallets. And so remember that John felt his exo supported his back while lifting, but got in his way for everything else. Exos that can be used for a variety of tasks like these without restriction are much more likely to be accepted. Another big one is, is PPE tools and equipment. Workers have been using these for a lot longer than they've known about exoskeletons and disruption in their ability to do so really becomes a deal breaker for most. Even putting the thought into a client's head that there is an issue or leaves a bad impression. Images we see examples of workers on cherry picker style forklifts, wearing fall protection harnesses, riding electric pallet jacks, transferring products between pallets and conveyors, shrink wrapping pallets, cutting shrimp, shrink wrap off pallets, and using handheld runners. If exoskeletons them from doing any of these things, it's going to be a problem in the logistics industry. Another one less obvious, very important challenges for exoskeleton users is trying to take breaks or go to the bathroom. A lot of times workers only have 15 minutes for a break and they know that their manager is watching the clock. They're, they're really aware of this. The easier it is for workers to keep an exo on for a break or take it off and put it back on very quickly to go to the bathroom, the better off. Another less obvious but very important challenge for workers is working in tight spaces. So in the image on the left, there's no way the worker is going to be able to squeeze into that hole if he's wearing an exoskeleton and it sticks out from his body. He barely has enough clearance to fit through the hole by himself. And in the image on the right, an exoskeleton that sticks out from the body is going to be very likely to snag. And remember, this was one of the reasons John reported for not wanting to use his exoskeleton anymore in a warehouse environment. So as Carl and, and Mark and Matt and the rest of my team really has discussed in their presentations, it's more difficult to design exoskeletons that get out of the way than it is to design exoskeletons that assist people. Users are very sensitive about movement restrictions, and these are one of the most common complaints from users, and it was a big gripe for John. So this is really key for me in wearability. The devices need to assist on call, but get out of the way the rest of the time and, and look sexy all the time. So even if we do all these things and we build exoskeletons that people want to use, Next, we get to implementation, and, and if they're not implemented properly, none of that will even matter. So a great exoskeleton in the hands of someone who doesn't know why or how to use it can't really do its job, and humans can build great technology, and, and a lot of people at this conference are truly building great technology, but if it sits in the corner and collects dust, it's not really going to help anyone. So users need education and support with implementation. Over the past few years of working very closely with these devices and their users, I've learned that there are things that we can do to drive acceptance and adoption of exo technology. And one is first produce the best possible exo. 
workers because we can't really be successful if workers like John are refusing to use exo technology. Two is focus on where we can make a serious impact. Exo devices are not for every single job or every single person, and we really need to be tactical about our focus. Three is, is get some skin in the game. And, and this requires everybody really work closely together for there to be budgets and companies like, like Toyota and Boeing have shown us to have internal systems in place to support implementation. Four is to have an executive steering committee because it makes, it makes other managers and workers have a much easier job uh, of adopting the technology when it's supported from the top. Five is, is certify super users, because one of the things I've learned is that we really need champions on the floor in the workplace and finding people that are willing to take the lead, getting them trained, making them truly feel special about it, and working closely with them to support their success is very because their failure is our failure and we really need to help them win. We also need to train users, managers, and any support staff that are involved. If the workplace exo system, as some call it, not educated, they are set up to fail. Seven is get the fit of the exoskeletons perfectly dialed. I, I how important user fit comfort really in sustaining the use of the technology. And eight is collect data. I'm a firm believer in the saying that we, we can't manage what we don't measure. And we need to listen very carefully and learn from the users. There are other implementation considerations as well. This is not an exhaustive list. Things like union contracts and sharing devices between workers add additional levels of complexity to the implementation of exoskeletons. But last but not least on implementation is, is I like we need to take a participatory ergonomics approach. And this really involves the workers who will be wearing the exoskeletons in the decision making process because nobody really likes to be told what to do. And in my experience, this is one of the most important implementation best practices. The folks that I've worked with have really liked getting education about the different exo options that are available to them and they really appreciate being able to try different options, feel them for themselves, and pick the ones that they like the best. This empowers them to design their own lives, and they're really grateful for it, and they're much more likely to buy into using the device long term. So at HeroWare, we've combined all of these lessons to help our clients implementation, and we developed a program to support them with all of these obvious and non-obvious challenges that come along with implementation and adoption. And like Mark Harris said, we're calling this program Hero Care 360. And our goal is really to deliver an excellent customer experience throughout the entire life cycle of the products. So this is going to include multiple levels of training and support and systems for storage, cleaning, and exo sustainment. So what gets us up every morning at HeroWare is the ability to leverage science and technology to help people in physically demanding jobs. And we really envision a world where all people have access to exoskeletons and exosuits and other types of technology as well to keep them safe, productive, and providing for their families. So again, we wanna thank you all very much for your attention and we're happy to answer any questions with the time we have remaining. Okay, we have about 10 questions. Get uh, all of our panel members to go ahead and put their video on and unmute their mics. I'm sorry, you guys, but I've lost video because I, okay. I break all. Uh, sure. So. Okay, so uh, we'll start with a question for Matt. And uh, this question is, can a back assist exosuit reduce lumbar loading as much as a comparable force rigid exoskeleton? What other major differences do you see? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So 
Yes, is the answer. We just showed the data there that um, most of these exos tend to be in the 10 to 40% range, depending on how stiff your spring is, <laughs> if you saw Carl's talk yesterday. Um, so yes, it can reduce lumbar loading in the same range. Um, other differences uh, come down to the really obvious ones. So um, how do they fit and feel in the participant? How free are they to move? Um, and those are going to be very device dependent and fit dependent. Okay. Here's a question for uh, Jason and Terry from the previous logistics talk. Uh, can you provide references on the TLV topic? So on the TLV topic, there is a, a publication by ACGIH, which lists the previous studies that went into the development of the curve. So that's something that we could, um, uh, if they contact us, we can give them the reference to that. Okay, great. And the other thing you could do is, um, I don't know if you can pull up the, uh, the Q&A box as well. You should be able to see it. Uh, that was the first question. You could actually okay. type, type the answer right there and it'll go directly back to Stefano. All right. Um, next question. What permissions, uh, for example, doctor's permissions, employer permissions, etc., did you need or uh, impediments did you encounter with using industrial exos in a restricted duty type work situation? So yeah, I I, like an injury recovery situation. Yeah, yeah, I can I can take that question. Um, uh, lar largely the, the process that we used in doing that is the one that was developed uh, in conjunction with the where, um, Washington State Department of Labor and Industries Exoskeleton Advisory Committee. That's available on the Washington LNI website, but um, there was a need for the multidisciplinary return to work team to first round on the case and, and by appropriate cases. There, there is a physician and, and numerous nurses involved in that in that group that had to then approve of, of the case for both um, the pathology injury as well as um, the level of restriction that the person was currently at and the job that they had to go back to. Um, then what they did was they had to reach out to the worker's actual physician and get that approval from that physician as well. So it, it really is um, quite a process to get all the levels of approval needed to do that. But um, in that case, uh, we did see that it, it, it helped the worker, it helped support his back during a really important time too for, for the healing of those tissues. But the ultimately that he gave for not wanting the device anymore, weren't really related to the assistance that it was providing for him. It was related to the restriction with doing everything else. So, you know, I would just say that there are a lot of hoops, so to speak, that you have to jump through, I think, right now, especially because that's a relatively unexplored a new frontier for using exoskeletons. Um, but there are appropriate cases, and when you find them, the devices can be very beneficial. Great. A uh, little bit different type of question from one of our uh, young developers, and that is, uh, which key enabling technologies do you feel are really missing to address the challenges you've seen uh, as you've been using the technologies that currently exist? I can take that one again, too. Um, you okay. know, some of the some of the key things that I think need to happen is, is that uh, we really need to make these devices um, something that people really want to wear, like clothing, like get it as close to the clothes that people love to wear or, their sh or the shoes that they love to wear or the watch that they love to wear as possible because um, it's hard to get people to go outside of their comfort zone. In, in the case that I was talking about with John, um, there were tremendous social aspects of that case that I really didn't go into details about, but, you know, we're talking about workers calling him things like the bionic man and, you know, just having to deal with almost a little bit of like work bullying happened. So mm -hmm. the more that we can do for people that is, uh, I hate to say it, but like cool and hip and, and that everybody wants to get theirs, 
um, everybody wants to have one and use it, that, that's really going to help drive adoption in this. Okay, so a little bit less about the technology itself and more about kind of how it integrates into the existing environment and on that worker. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, we've got a question here for Matt Yandel. Uh, why do you think some of the participants did not show EMG benefit in the simulated task? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. So um, there's multiple reasons for that. One of them is even in lab studies, you see this sort of uh, user specific variability in how they respond to an intervention. Um, and I'll kind of couple my answer in with another question that was asked about training time. So training time is uh, a big part of this. We've seen the metabolic studies, um, that people take a lot of time to learn to optimize their use of exoskeletons, at least metabolically. Um, and an overall just human experience, right? You didn't learn to ride a bike the very first time. It took a lot of time to get really good at it. And so that's the case with any of these wearable technologies. So um, they usually wore it for about five to 10 minutes before we started doing various kinds of testing. Um, and so the, in between the variability that we see in the field versus the lab and the amount of training time and then just individual variations. So for instance, several of the participants had large amounts of adipose tissue which is going to make it harder to um, read EMG signals. That's another place that could, it could affect things. And so there's, there's all these variables. That's why we focus on the sort of key outcomes of high level where participants seeing reductions in EMG rather than focusing too exclusively on, on one individual subject. Okay. A uh, question for Matt Yandel as well. How do you account for lumbar disc, L4, L5, or L5S1 loading for flexion, extension, as well as combined rotations? There's sure. There's a little so, more to it, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you start with it there. Yeah, sure. Um, so this was not intended to directly measure that loading, of course, and um, all of our previous lab work um, as well as this field work was more focused on kind of the sagittal, uh, I should say on the lab, lab work specifically, focused on the sagittal improvements. So um, we have estimates, if you look back at our uh, papers uh, by Lommers and Zellick about uh, reducing that lumbar loading based on how much force is going through the suit. Um, the suit itself doesn't um, like result in more loading because of twisting, which is, which is a key and in some cases may actually help, but we haven't formally tested that. So. Um, for instance, if you're standing up, you can do full twisting motions with no resistance. Um, if you were to do a standing motion and then do sort of a windmill to the opposite foot and stretch it in sort of a twisting manner, the suit actually assists you, but we haven't measured to see how much that would offload your back. Yeah, and part of the question included really trying to kind of hone in on biomechanical effectiveness uh, and the change as body mass changes per person wearing it yeah that's a really in, that's a really interesting uh question because um if you have a larger person let's say it's mostly due to adipose tissue they actually get more benefit from the suit for a larger posterior moment arm shall we say um but then they also could have more loading because the loads could be farther away from their spine if they're carrying a box in in front of them and so that's going to be um user specific so the suit's obviously going to give just as much if not more assistance to those kinds of people but modeling exactly how much spinal compression they're going to have is, is a very difficult thing, obviously, because of the amount of uh, different and complex tissues in the lower back. Okay, and we'll, uh, we'll end on this question. Um, and this is also for Matt Yandel or, or Matt Marino. How long did your test subjects need to wear the exosuit before you began taking measurements? Uh, one of the things that others have found in their studies and that you alluded to as well is that there, there's a little bit of a get used to it kind of phase and, and almost like a training phase before you wanna start uh, doing the testing for efficacy. How long did it take for, uh, for you all? Yeah, so I, I mentioned five to 10 minutes, sometimes upward of 15 for people. So um, they would, uh, we come in and have them fit with the exosuit and get, have them try it out, try to do a few different motions in it. 
Um, and then we had them do uh, a set of squats, both with and without the exoskeleton. So kind of familiarize them with its function and, and use. So I can say that by the time they started the testing, they were familiar with its function and used to how it should feel. Um, but we totally acknowledge that we would have liked more training time. That's literally just a limit, practical limit due to the environment. We were asking people to come off of their job where they were producing for the company they were working for and come do testing with us. And so we, we would prefer to do multiple day testing, but that just wasn't feasible um, with the clients that we were dealing with. Got it. Okay. So you weren't able to wear it for this shift. We're not going to take any measurements and then we'll talk with you again tomorrow and then see if there were any issues with it. And then we'll, we'll take measurements after we correct. The focus of this was objective and subjective short-term data to see how it was behaving in the field. And then this summer, uh, we're going to do those longer, more extended trials where we have people wear it for several weeks to see what their impressions are. Great. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank all of the panelists. Uh, we are out of time at this point. Uh, Matt Yandel, uh, Matt Marino, Terry Butler, and Jason Gillette. This has been fantastic. Two excellent logistics uh, forum for everybody. And uh, please join us in the next session, which will be the last full session prior to our closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks.